I've never had anybody ask me these uh, these uh, in an interview. I've done a hundred interviews literally in the last three months. I've never, I've maybe never talked so long about specific kinds of evidential cases. In North America alone, estimates indicate that up to 20 million people have reported near-death experiences of some sort. Hi there. Welcome to the Carpenter's Desk. Today I'm glad to have with me Dr. Gary Habermas, who is an American historian and philosopher of religion, who chairs the Department of Philosophy at Liberty University in Virginia. Over the last few decades, Dr. Habermas has been arguably the leading expert on the topic of the bodily resurrection of Jesus, its historicity and theological implications. And today we are going to be discussing on an empirical case against naturalism, near-death experiences which actually factors into his own work on the resurrection. Welcome, Dr. Habermas, to the Carpenter's Desk. Good to be with you fellows again. Had a good time last time and looking forward to it again. Thank you, Dr. Habermas. And before moving any further, uh, I just want to tell the viewers that you can actually find links to our previous conversations with Dr. Habermas in the description box. We had one fascinating conversation on religious claims and historicity, why Christianity stands apart, and also a short response to Jordan Peterson's views on the resurrection, both the links in the description. And if you're actually interested in such conversations and uh, apologetics re resources in general, do not forget to subscribe and tap the bell icon. So Dr. Habermas, you know, before moving any further, the first question that any person who's watching this might have is, what has a Christian scholar got to do with something like near-death experiences? What got you interested in this topic? Um, <clears throat> I went through a long period of doubt. It uh, it lasted for, well, all of 10 years and parts of about the next 10 years. And you know what? This is interesting. A publication <clears throat> uh, about me, I didn't write it, but a publication was just uh, released recently, and I just happened to read it. And it said that I was going through doubts when I was a teenager. Well, that's true, especially in my late teens. But I have an incident in my life that I've talked about before where I've, I've said I got really interested in Buddhism and uh, came close to, in my mind, came close to uh, being a Buddhist. Well, that idea, I guess, is that I was a teenager or something. Actually, it was after I already had my PhD. So it was quite a bit later than that. I was, um, I was about 30 at the time. And uh, yeah, and I started studying Buddhism. So I was still having questions about my faith that late uh, after my PhD. So uh, friends would tell me on your, you know, questions about your faith. They'll say, why don't you check out this or that? And I would, I would study, well, I could list the reason. I, could, I started studying the reliability of the New Testament, archaeology, what we now call intelligent design, all kinds of things. And then one day I realized that if the resurrection of Jesus were an historical event, it could potentially ground Christianity. But my problem was that claim that the resurrection, if true, would ground Christianity. While that claim made sense, I didn't know much about the resurrection. So I started studying the resurrection to see if it was an historical event. and in those days, we would take notes on three by five cards, little note cards, and put them in a file, in a file box. And I ended up having 1,600 cards in my study. Anyway, that launched my interest in the resurrection, and I guess you'd say the rest is history. Yeah, so as far as I understand, it was the work that you were already doing on the resurrection that led you to study near-death experiences. You know, it did. And it was probably only a few, about the same time I was doing my doctoral dissertation, my PhD on the resurrection. About that same time, I started studying the early near-death literature that was coming out. This is in the early 70s, 1970s. And I saw some claims 
that there was some evidence for near-death experiences. And to me, here's how the two come together. I, I recently saw a, a book by a leading atheist philosopher. <clears throat> and he said that atheists have an advantage over theists because theists need another world to be true. They need this world in which we work and live and walk and another world where there's God and an afterlife. So they require two worlds. And I thought at the time that if NDEs are legitimate and if there's evidence for them and there's evidence for an afterlife, that is, I guess you can call it another world, but that's another realm, evidence for another realm. For uh, The easiest example would be, well, I'll tell you what, I'll use an, an Indian uh, student of mine. He's one of my doctoral students. And um, when he, he grew up in India and he fell out of a tree when he was a teenager and he, he landed on his head. Well, the interesting thing was his mom came out of the house and she was kind of screaming and she was holding his body on the ground and she was saying, don't die, don't die, don't die. Now he was up above her watching her and he kept yelling down at her, mom, I'm okay. Mom, I'm all right. Don't cry. I'm fine. Look at me. I'm fine. But she never looked up and saw him. She kept holding his body saying, don't die on me. Now that little illustration right there is an example of how an NDE person, and there are thousands of accounts like this, women who give birth and they're up above their body and something happens on the dial and it says, uh-oh, she's, she's in trouble um, to the anesthesiologist. Well, the woman saying to them, I feel fine. Same thing my Indian student was saying. I feel fine. Guys, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. And nobody looks up at her. No one looks. And so to me, that's an indication. Another world is a little too radical, but I mean, that's another kind of existence. And to me, what ties NDEs into resurrection is that if NDEs are an argument for an afterlife and the resurrection is an argument for an afterlife, People can't say, well, you guys believe in two worlds. You believe in this world where we can't see it, but it's there, and you want me to believe that. Well, NDE say, no, something's going on because here's evidence, and I can report evidence. Does, does that make sense? That does. It, it's, it's evidence of another, I guess maybe the best world, word is another reality. and just like my Indian student, his mom wasn't looking at him and saying, oh dear, you're fine. Come on down here out of that tree. And, and uh, I thought you were hurt, hurt. No, she didn't know he was up there. So to me, that was a good intro, intro to the field of the afterlife. And, and, and interestingly enough, in the New Testament, um, the, the event the doctrine, the doctrine that is tied to the event of the resurrection more than any other one is that believers will be raised like Jesus. So that resurrection indicates afterlife. And so there's a historical event that claims to get us there versus a near death empirical event that says, this is what that reality is like. I don't know if that makes sense, but the two together seem to dovetail nicely for me one is being a generic claim to afterlife, and the other one being a specific Christian claim to afterlife. Yeah, so Dr. Habermas, before we move any further, it is important to define what do we mean by near-death experiences. So how would you define NDEs? Well, just in those two examples I gave of my friend, my student who fell out of the tree, and the many uh, ladies, women I've talked to who talk about delivering a child and being up above their body. What those two cases have in common is uh, near-death experiences are reported, I won't say this up front, near-death experiences are reported in other scenarios, but typically, typically a near-death experience is a state, a medical state 
from which you can be said to be in trouble if you don't get some immediate help. So it could be a person in a car accident. In that one instance of my uh, Indian student, the fellow who fell out of the tree and landed on his head. I mean, he got rushed to the hospital and was a, it was a really scary circumstance for his family. That's the kind of thing that starts these things. It's usually a medical situation where a, where a person is thought to be in a lot of difficulty, and then they're rescued from it either by calling 911, you know, uh, we get uh, uh, emergency workers come and, and work on the person. Something happens, and, and oftentimes, as soon as they're restored, they talk about seeing something over here, seeing something over there, and people can verify that. So a near-death state is a state from which you can reasonably be thought to be in trouble physically without help. And these experiences are reported by people who are in that situation, the person about whom everybody's concerned. Does that make sense? Yes, correct. Uh, so how common are these experiences? And can you like, you know, just walk us through the NDE research in the last couple of years? You know what? I, I didn't know you were going to ask me that, but I, because I have a book here and I do all my research on my desk here, here, I just happen to have this book right next to me. Here's a, one of the latest books. It's called The Science of Near-Death Experiences, okay. edited by a medical doctor. And his name is uh, John Hagen. And the book is published by one of our university presses. It's published by University of Missouri Press, one of the universities here. But the thing is, every article in this book was previously published in a medical journal. Now, before you say anything else, you think, oh, wow. These things were published in medical journals? Yep. And the book was published in a secular university press? Yep. Okay, why is that significant? Well, the book starts out like this. The book starts out with the comment that in North America alone, estimates, estimates indicate that up to 20 million people in North America have reported near-death experiences of some sort or some near-death phenomena. Um, and, and when you say that, you could say, well, they're all delusional, or they don't know what they're talking about. They extended that comment to Europe, Europe, as I remember correctly, and they said up to 30 million people if we extend this to Europe. Now, uh, that's a large, large number. And you could, if you could imagine saying, um, well, that's crazy. Those people didn't know what they were talking about. Or, oh, yeah, we all hallucinate when we get sick. Or if that's your response, I'm wondering how many of those 30 million cases, 20 million in North America, how many of those cases would, would you start thinking something was going on if they were evidenced? And so in a recent debate, well, uh, 2016, um, a written debate, uh, I produced a, a list of over 300 evidence near-death experiences. I don't mean I made the list. I mean, I, re I divided them into five categories and gave examples. And a number of them, to give you one example, not of an NDE, but of a, of a case, uh, I mean a category, uh, there are a number of people who are in states where there's no measurable brain or heart activity. The heart has a, cardi a species of cardiac arrest where the heart stops working. And according to experiments, in 15 to 30 seconds, your brain stops operating. They go, well, that can't be because people are alive today. Correct, they can come back from that. That's what resuscitation is about. That's what our different methods and machines are about. But while they're in that state, if they have no measurable, measurable, heart or brain activity, but they report something that happens a mile away or happens outside a hospital, but there's no windows in their room, and this could be verified from a police report or from other data. Uh, why should you be observing things when the machines say you have no heart and brain activity? So there's an example of how science gets involved. And if you say, well, 20 million people in North America, we know those guys were all crazy. Um, you know, you can say, well, then you explain 
the hundreds of data cases. And that's where I think people are starting to take notice. The fact that those articles were published in medical journals show you that people are, are noticing some of this information. That's a long explanation, but I hope that helps. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. So you have actually talked about evidence cases, right? But when we are talking about something like near-death experiences, how would you actually categorize and investigate them? I mean, how would you, you know, bucket them as evidence cases and those cases that cannot be verified per se? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, the evidence cases, let, let's just give a typical near-death experience. The person says, like the two cases I gave, let's say a generic case of a woman in childbirth or my friend who fell out of the tree, and the, the initial stage is looking down and seeing it and going, wow, I feel great, but how come I can't talk to anybody? How come they don't see me? Go, hello, hello, I'm here, and nobody looks. Okay, that's often how it starts. But the evidential portion concerns a, a, an observation in this world. For example, <clears throat> if you're in surgery on the first floor of a hospital and your family members are gathered in a room because it's a real serious surgery and they're in a waiting room two floors away, let's say they're two floors away in a hospital, you're in an operating room, there are no windows. This is a really serious antiseptic, wash your hands, be all dressed up, lights overhead, but no windows. And the experience happens while the person is in the room. Sometimes they are drawn to where their loved ones are. This is pretty common. They go where their loved ones are. So in this case, let's say they say, well, I went up, I, I these are actual cases. They'll say, I kind of went through the floor and I, I went up the ceiling and I went two floors up. I guess that's where I was, but I went to where my family was. And they'll report things that the family members said in the room during the event. And later they will check these things out. Or maybe somebody in the room is doing something really odd. And you could say, well, somebody could have later told them what somebody said in the room. They might've just heard something and thought they were there. No, what if they reported seeing something really odd in the room, but later that same incident was verified, or if they saw something outside in a parking lot, or, you know, but, but inside, but you can't see out the window because there aren't any windows. Here's, here's one for you. Um, in one case, a person was having surgery, but they, they were up above their body. It was a moment of crisis. They were up above their body. They were looking down. But in surgical wards and hospitals, sometimes surgical wards are side by side by side. And they're doing, because they're all wired the same way. And this person kind of could, kind of drifted through the wall, so to speak. I know that sounds silly, but they kind of drifted through the wall. And they watched a man having his leg amputated. Okay, we know people have egg, leg amputations, but they watched him having his leg amputated amputated and the surgeon the, the the medical personnel took the leg and put it into a yellow plastic bag and laid it aside okay when you come to you could say man i don't know who that guy was but i saw a surgery next door and i saw them cutting his leg off and they put this leg in a yellow bag well if you say that to a, a medical doctor who, or a nurse who comes in and sees you and talks to you, it doesn't take a lot for that person to check out if there was a surgery next door, if a man right now, I mean, you know, 20 feet away where the person's having the leg amputated. And then you say, well, you probably saw the leg amputation on television. You probably saw one of those reenactment TV things. Yeah. Okay. Well, what did they do with his leg? What if they found out they put the leg in a yellow bag? Just an odd thing like that, a yellow plastic bag, you know, to go to the laboratory or something. Who knows? To have it checked out. But a yellow plastic bag? You're either right or wrong on that. And if it turns out to be right, I know what happened after your surgery started because I know when their surgery started. So I could say, how could you observe that when you were in this room under general anesthesia, you were out? 
for, let's say, let's say your surgery took four hours, but you saw that, and that was a real quick surgery in the middle of yours. How would you know those things? So to answer your question, the evidence near-death experiences frequently happen in the environment right around us. It's the next room over. It's the visitor's room where our family is. In one uh, well-known case, a woman was up above her body and she was looking down and somebody had, had um, there, was a, there was a medical device in the room with a number uh, on top, like, 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 a, um, you know, like a registration number on top of the machine. But it was way high above the ground. You couldn't see it. It was, uh, this, it was on top of this device that was six to eight feet above the ground. And so when she came to, as soon as she came to, she told the nurses, she said, there's a 12 digit number up on top of that machine. And she said, I'm obsessed. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. And when I see large numbers, she said, I memorize those numbers. And she said, here's the number. And she, she said, get, get out paper, get out a piece of paper. So the, the nurse got out a piece of paper and she said, here's the 12 digits. And she wrote them down and the nurse put it away. Well, later they had to move that machine and they sent a guy up there on a ladder to see if there was a number up on top. He had to get on a ladder to see it. And he reported the number and it was exactly what the woman said she saw. Now they know that happened afterwards because you wouldn't be looking down on the, up on the top of the machine, but she said she was up above her body during surgery. So it's things like that where you can verify things in this world. We're not talking about I mean, people do say, I think I saw an angel or things like that, but we're not talking about verification for an angel. We're talking about verifications as simple as 12 digit numbers and amputated legs being put in yellow plastic bags. It's simple things that can be verified, but it happened during your surgery when there was a crisis and you had no measurable, you had a cardiac arrest and you had no measurable heart or brain activity. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how a lot of these read. Oh yes, definitely these uh, cases make perfect sense. Uh, in fact, the cases that we have just discussed, uh, they are you know, particularly those kind of cases that can be verified. I mean, it completely rules out the possibility that uh, this is just a state of the mind. And as you mentioned yourself, you have put together how much 300 such evidenced cases? Yeah, what I did when I was dialoguing with this fellow, by the way, the fellow was a, was a professor at Oxford University. And um, what I did was I, cat I keep a catalog of evidential cases I find in my study. I've been doing this for, for decades. And I have, I have a list of, of um, over 300 evidence cases. And I divided them during my debate, a written debate. I divided the evidence into five categories. And those categories would be evidence from inside the room, something they saw in the surgery room, evidence outside the room, like, you know, in the next surgical lab or your, where your family was two floors away in the hospital or, or maybe something back at your house. Because people often say they, they saw into their house. Um, so away from it, then you have NDEs in blind people. There are a number of cases where blind persons who've been blind from birth, they've, they have never seen anything in their whole life except during their NDE. And they report it. Let's say, well, what if it was a blind person who saw something and reported it? but now they're blind again and they can't see anything, but they saw during that. So some of them are blind. And then some of them are real weird cases. Like for example, there are a few um, recorded cases, one in a medical publication where a medical person shared the NDE with the person who was supposedly dying but they got caught into it and saw what the person saw, like a vision. And they saw what the person said they experienced. And then the, 
the healthy medical person reported it, it, it it's odd. But there, it's an odd category where there's something evidential. I don't mean just someone saw something, but but what these all have in common is these things are measurable or observable uh, by somebody who's healthy, and it was checked on. And we know the case of the woman that's that had the twelve digit number. My researcher actually checked up on that and got in touch with the original people who were involved, um, at least one of them who was there. And we heard it all. We saw it in the in print, but we heard it again from the description from this person who told us told told my research assistant personally. So when you hear enough of these and the people tell the same story, now this story was published a few years ago. When the person reports the same story, the person who was there and witnessed it, the, the, the healthy person who was witnessing it, when they told the same thing, that's just, that's just backup that some of these things can be verified. So th th this is the important point that the NDE information is frequently about this world. It's what it's what happened in the next room. It's what happened two floors up. It's what happened in my home. It's a measurement on a machine where they saw a machine registered. They watched this machine in the operating room and they went back and got the doctor's report and the machine reading is registered in the doctor's report that was filled out during the surgery. Things like that where people observe very common, a, a nurse could have seen that number, but why is the NDE person seeing that number when they're in, under general anesthesia? That's the kind of things I'm talking about. And those are the examples of five categories where I divide the evidence. Does that make, does that make sense? Oh, yes, uh, that does. And, you know, I'm like uh, stunned just listening to the kind of evidence that you are talking about. So I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Habermas, when you are actually presenting such strong evidenced cases, what is the best naturalistic responses that you have heard? How do naturalists, you know, respond to such sort of evidence? Okay. Christians who do apologetics know what natural responses look like, right? People will say about the resurrection, oh, the disciples saw hallucinations, or maybe they were copying some other ancient mythology. Um, those are some of the things that Christian apologists are used to. But NDEs are different. NDEs are different because there's a line in the sand, so to speak. If there, if there were a line in the sand and you were to say to somebody, you're on this side of the line, so you're alive. But if you step over that line, you're dead. You won't be able to come back. So don't step over that line. That sounds like a movie or something. But if you say you can't cross that line or you'll be dead, if you think of it that way, the natural theories against NDEs are on this side of the line. They're on the physical side of the line. And they'll say, oh, well, hey, I've had patients like that. You had a right lobe temporal seizure. Well, we, well, you could have an epileptic seizure over the right uh, temporal lobe over your right ear and your brain. You could say, oh, well, you probably had a case of oxygen deprivation. You were oxygen starved, or you had an hallucination. Okay, here's what's crazy. It's on this, all the explanations are on the living side of the line. What, what I mean by that is they make things up. They, they invent a scenario that is true of living persons. People do have seizures. People do see hallucinations. People can have oxygen deprivation. Here's the problem. Those internal physical conditions cannot explain evidence from over the line. They, they cannot explain evidence of another reality. I go back to my Indian student. He didn't have any evidence. It was just a really personal thing to him that he was yelling down to his mom saying, mom, I'm fine. I don't like to see you cry. Stop it, mom. Stop it. But she wasn't listening and she didn't know he was there. Now, the interesting thing is when they're saying, well, you had oxygen deprivation. Well, okay, okay, fine. Maybe my Indian student, he would just laugh. Maybe my Indian student was having one of those situations. He was having uh, oxygen deprivation or an epileptic seizure 
or a hallucination. Okay, let's say that. But what about the people who report the amputated leg in the yellow bag or the 12 digit number from the roof? Things inside my brain don't make me see 12 digit numbers up on top of medical equipment. It doesn't make me tell you what they did with the amputated leg in the next room. You see, um, does that make sense? Uh, no oxygen deprivation makes those pictures. Not if the picture is verified. If they say, oh no, there was nothing like that. You must have been dreaming. We didn't even, the guy in the next ward had a cancer operation uh, on his stomach. Nothing to do with the amputating the leg. Well, then that would just show you that the guy was having one of those internal sorts of things. It was an hallucination or it was a seizure or something. But if it can be verified, that's over the line. And an over the line observation is not answered by an inside the line, inside my head condition. So naturalistic theories for near death experiences are different because they're on this side of the line, but all the evidence events are not on this side of the line. So you can't, you can't make up a verified report because you had a seizure. That wouldn't give you a verified report out there. Wow. I've never had any, I've never had anybody ask me these, uh, these uh, in an interview, I've done, I've done a hundred interviews literally in the last three months, but I don't get questions. So I, as I'm talking, I'm hoping, I'm saying to myself, I hope this is coming across okay because it's hard to explain, you know, in air in midair here. Yeah, this is actually coming out pretty well. Uh, I'm enjoying this thoroughly, and I hope the viewers too will be thrilled with the kind of evidence that you're sharing. To be honest, these are questions that I personally had. What would be the best naturalistic response be to NDEs because in, when you talk about the resurrection of Jesus, the naturalist might, you know, reject some of the facts. They might say that, well, this event is allegedly, you know, it has only happened once in history and all of that. But when you see the frequency of cases with respect to NDEs, uh, they're also happening in the present day and there's so much verifiable evidence. I was so curious about what the naturalist response would be. And you've given a brilliant reply there. So we see that NDE is actually uh, proved to be a good defeater for naturalism. But what about other religious groups that actually, like Christianity, would believe in beyond the line, in the supernatural realm? So does the evidence for near-death experiences actually point to a particular religion per se? Tell you what, I keep going back to this case in India because it's not evidence, there's no evidence but it's just a general kind of experience that hundreds, thousands, millions of people have reported looking down on your body, okay? If you hear that, people in a lot of religions will say, see, that's an afterlife. That's what we've been talking about. And if you read ancient books, you can read books from the 19th century. You can read books from a thousand years ago. And they have reports, Plato, Plato has an account of a near-death experience wow. of a soldier who was struck down in battle, and he said he went to heaven and hell. Okay, these are very, very common throughout the world. And most people would say hallucination, temporal lobe seizure, oxygen deprivation. And you couldn't measure during Plato's day, how do you know that guy didn't have one of those? But today, we can measure things that happen outside the room in other ways, and, and there's enough evidence cases that they end up in medical journals. Okay, but what about your religious question? A Hindu, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Jew, a Christian, five, five people, throw, throw Confucianism in there, that's six. Let's stand those six people side by side. Many of them would say, yeah, we have hundreds of stories like that in our folklore, in our religious folklore going back centuries. And they would stand shoulder to shoulder. And at this point, they probably wouldn't argue about what religion's true because this doesn't answer those questions. But here's what they would say. See, all those atheists who don't think there's every, anything after death, they're all wrong. So at this point, the Confucianists, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Jew, the Muslim, the Christian would all agree. They would be on the same line, agreeing that naturalism, 
the view that the natural world is all there is and there's no personal God, they would say, that view is wrong. Why? Because you guys only have this side of the line, the line to the sand. Your world is about this side, and you think everything happens on this side of the line, but we have evidence for that side of the line. And they'd say, where's your evidence? Well, for hundreds of years, people would say, well, I don't have any hard evidence, but I have those stories in my religion from hundreds and thousands of years ago, like Plato. We have those stories. They go, yeah, well, you're all dreaming. Okay, until just recently, it can be verified. So here's the difference. All these religions can say, I don't know if my religion is true or false or if your religion is true or false, but I do know that those guys who don't think there's anything over the line are wrong. So what this indicates is not, when they start reporting things in the other world, I don't mean, I don't mean operations and falling out of trees and 12 digit numbers. I mean, when a person says, when a Hindu says, I've got a book over here, I'm in my study, I've got a book over here on my shelf, I'm pointing right to it, which is 600 interviews with Indian, uh, from India, um, ne uh, near death phenomena. And the, by far the largest part of the crowd are Hindus. And they record similar things. There's recordings of um, Buddhists in China who have similar recordings. Okay. What they all agree on is religion is right and non-religion is wrong. So people who say there's not religion, uh, they don't have anything to go on. However, when the person starts saying, and these are very common, when someone says, again, Hindu, Jew, Muslim, Christian, they could say, I saw an angel. I was with this beautiful, luminous being who surrounded me with the most incredible love I've ever felt in my life. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to go back. Okay, when you hear those stories, now if you're not careful, the Hindu might say, see, my religion's true. And the Buddhist might say, no, my religion's true. And even the Christian could say, see, my religion's true because I saw an angel. Those experiences are not verified. They, I hate to say it, but some of those experiences could be hallucinations, seizures, te uh, temporal lobe problems, oxygen deprivation. Because how do you know you were with an angel? Um, I don't know, but it sure felt good. Yeah, okay, let me ask my question again. How do you know you were with an angel? Hmm, I guess I don't. Did anybody else see it with you? No. Did one of your family members see the angel and can report it to us? No. Okay. But it was a really nice experience. Oh, it was a gorgeous experience. Okay. Well, it stays a gorgeous experience in your own mind. The Christian is no different than the Hindu. The Christian is no different than the Muslim. They all have this good experience, but there's no data. Okay. Hence my argument that evidence in this world that there's another world shows you that non-religion is false but I can't tell you which religion is true. From near-death near death experiences say there's an afterlife, but they don't say which religion is true. Now, when the person comes back, they've been a Hindu all their life. They've been a Christian all their life. They will believe that it's their religion that's true. That's just normal. We'll all ter interpret it in our own brain, and we'll think our religion is true. I, I guess this is a silly, a silly argument, but let me put it this way. You saw an angel, I saw an angel. Whose angel was it? Which religion's angel was it? I don't know. Well, I don't know either. You know, I, does that make sense? There's no evidence for which religion is right. There's only evidence that naturalism is wrong. And I think that's the value of near-death experience. Think of it this way. Intelligent design arguments tell you that there must be some kind of God in the universe because of all the fine tuning and the incredible laws of nature, which by the way, are having a, a big influence in science today. But what's it tell you? That there's another power, something's in control, something's out there, but we can't start having a church based on this. You never heard of a, a, 
a church of intelligent design. You never heard of the church of near death experiences. Those things don't tell you which religion is true, but they're all in the same category of data that say some religious things like an afterlife are true, but I can't tell you what church to go to. Correct. There's no evidence for the angel you saw or the angel I saw. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, so kind of, I kind of understand where this is going. So you have actually given good evidence for near-death experiences, and that will eliminate the possibility of naturalism being true. Uh, but I still want to know that how does near-death experiences actually factor into your work on the resurrection of Jesus? Well, okay, let's put it this way. I often talk about Christianity popularly or metaphorically or mythically, if you will, and I'll say, following Jesus is like Pilgrim's Progress, the famous book, right. or it's like the Wizard of Oz and people walking down the yellow brick road, walking toward the Emerald City, right? Those are, those are metaphorical pictures of a quest and a trail that we go through life and end up in the celestial kingdom. You know, fairy tales are based on that kind of thing. And I'll say, look, everybody has stories about the yellow brick road and Pilgrim's Progress and famous, famous stories like that. We all have those stories. NDEs tell us that there really is another world where we can be on a quest. Now the resurrection says, here's why the resurrection is different. The resurrection says, if God raised Jesus from the dead, what other explanation could there be than that if God did that? And Jesus said, my father, when they asked him for a sign, he said the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the fish, and I'll be three days and nights. Okay, when he's raised from the dead, if there is good evidence for the resurrection, dead men don't do much. So Jesus wouldn't have just woken up and walked away. He said, my father is going to raise me. If his father raised him, what does that say? Now, to me, here's the, here's the kind of person God doesn't raise from the dead. Someone who's a heretic. Someone who says, get on the Christian yellow brick road and walk toward the Emerald City and avoid all the things around you that want to get you off the yellow brick road. Okay, God doesn't raise somebody from the dead who gets you off the yellow brick road and doesn't let you find the Emerald City. You know, God doesn't raise people who are heretics. And in the history of religions, in the history of religions, no other founder of a major world religion is believed to have been raised from the dead. Even believed to, have, I, I don't mean fairy, I don't mean stories. I mean, who have, they say there's evidence. So if they say, if Christianity says, no, there is a yellow brick road, and we are walking down that road toward the Emerald City, and we have to avoid all the distractions in life. Well, how do you know that's true? Because that's what Jesus taught. Because see, the other radical thing Jesus taught is not just that God will raise me from the dead. Jesus said, and even liberal theologians agree, Jesus said that what you do with me determines where you spend eternity. I am your key to the celestial city. I am the key to the Emerald City. You want to get in? I'm your key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every religion says that, except that Jesus was raised from the dead. And then, you, and then the person says, huh, I think you're missing something. I have that book on my shelf over there. That's a fairy tale. Those things don't happen. And then I'll say, time out. Have you ever heard about near-death experiences? Because near-death experiences say there is another reality for an afterlife. So that's how I do it. I think that just says there's another world. Resurrection gives the best evidence for how to get to that world and who's the, who's the one by which we get into that world. Yeah, so you've actually connected the dots pretty well here from the near-death experiences to the specific case for the, the resurrection of Jesus. But moving ahead, Dr. Habermas, um, what would be the theological implications of near-death experiences? Because NDEs would imply an intermediary disembodied state, right? What is the scriptural evidence that we have? Uh, because every now and then we often hear stories about people going to heaven, going to hell and coming back. 
you've actually already mentioned the difference between inwardly uh, NDEs that can be verified and outwardly NDEs, but I just want you to weigh in on the theological implications of NDEs. Yeah, let me go back to the line in the sand, in this world and that world. <clears throat> there are a lot of stories. I was looking at three new books yesterday on people who've said, I went to heaven, but I also got a glimpse of hell. They showed me what hell was and I went to heaven. Okay, nice story. If they made it into a movie, it might warm your heart, but we have no evidence that it's true. You go, well, this is the Christian answer. That might be, but I don't have any, I don't have any evidence that your story's true. So when someone says, whoa, 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 are you saying those hell cases aren't true? And I'm saying, look, you might believe in hell, but if you're going to cite a near-death experience or somebody goes to hell, and by the way, 20% of near-death experiences, I wouldn't call them hell, but 20% of near-death experiences are negative near-death experiences. They're negative ones. And, but I'm not going to say there has to be a hell because 20% of near-death people saw that realm. That doesn't tell me anything, because how do I know? Now, now, I sound like the naturalist. How do I know that your seeing hell is not oxygen deprivation, an hallucination, or some psychotic whatever, and now you're out of it because you're out of the surgery? You know, I don't know that you saw hell. I don't know that a person was in hell, but I also don't know that you were in heaven or hugged an angel. I don't know that. So I can't, I can't verify those stories and I can listen to them. Some of them are feel good stories. Some of them are scary stories. I can hear them, but I don't put them in my list of evidence cases. What near death experiences help me do, it, again, let me use that illustration. If intelligent design shows you there's a being out there who cares about us and has a world, but I don't know who the being is, just to know there's a being is very, very important. Well, if there's, if there's evidence that says there's an afterlife out there, but I don't know what religion gets you there, but there's an afterlife. Well, that's very important information. So just because intelligent design doesn't tell me Christianity is true, near-death experiences don't tell you Christianity is true, but according to Bertrand Russell, the famous British atheist of the last generation, atheist philosopher, the two cardinal beliefs of atheism are there is no God and there is no afterlife. But if I have intelligent design argument for God, and if I have near-death evidence for afterlife, I have probably the two key arguments for religion of some sort. Now, now we can turn to apologetics to see which religion is true. That's what it is. I don't argue from angels and heaven and hell in these experiences. I only argue from 12-digit numbers and operations in the next room and things we can check out because they're scientifically verifiable. And back to this. That's why 12 of these articles can show up in medical journals and why it can be written in a title, The Science of Near-Death Experiences. It's sort of like the science of intelligent design, if that makes sense. It's a category, it's natural religion that doesn't tell you which supernatural religion is true, just right. that there is some religion out there. Right. So basically, we are not presupposing anything here, but through natural theology, we are coming to prove that there is a supernatural realm and you know, some sort of an evidence for God. And then we are actually coming to the specific case for the resurrection of Jesus for Christianity. Uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, and Dr. Habermas, before parting, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the status of your magnum opus and how much of that would be actually devoted to uh, near-death experiences. I, I only have, I only have an, well, I've got to paraphrase some things I've published, but I only have an, one appendix in the book, in the end of volume, well, in several, I have appendices in these writings. I'm going to put an appendix on near-death experiences in the study only because if you are doing a book on the God of Christianity, you might have an appendix on intelligent design. And if I'm going to do a book on the resurrection of Jesus, an appendix on near-death experiences points to Resurrection works in the afterlife. God's nature works in the area of intelligent design. Does that make sense? So I would put, a, I would put an appendix there that is like further scientific 
data that help us to understand this. Uh, so that's, it would only be an appendix in an overall very, very, very large study. I can already anticipate that this is going to be perhaps the most compelling case for the resurrection of Jesus, and we are eagerly looking forward to your book. Well, all I can say is I, I surely, surely hope you're correct. I hope it after I've worked on it for almost, uh, almost seven full years, and I work about 75 hours a week. I would, I would hope after all that work, I hope that's what it is. Thank you, Dr. Habermas, for coming on the Carpenter's Desk. Uh, again, it's, it's such a joy, privilege, and pleasure to have you on our platform. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it, fellas. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for letting me uh, have a platform for this.